Okay, what we're going to be talking about macroevolution, and I have this graphic um, to help depict that. Macroevolution is large scale. So macro that that prefix means large, micro means small, like microscope. Okay, um, and so we're going to be looking at more large scale evolution. So we're not going to be looking at, as you can see on the left hand side, like how a population changes to adapt to an environment. But in this case, we're looking at truly how new species form. Um, which is crazy because we have, if you think about it, so many species on Earth that are incredibly diverse. We have 300,000 species of beetles on our planet. Just beetles, 300,000, right? So we have a lot of species. Um, we're going to talk about why and how those come to be. That's macroevolution, okay? That thing that you're looking at on the right-hand side, you may have talked about in class, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, that's called a cladogram. And a cladogram is going to be a representation of how things are related, okay? So just, we're gonna look at them in a little bit, but the ones that are closer to one another, so like the orange and red dinosaur, the green and light blue dinosaur, the uh, blue bird and the purple dinosaur, those are gonna be our most closely related species. What that means is they had a common ancestor in the more recent past than other organisms did. So when we're talking about macroevolution, we're talking about how um, all species had a, a common ancestor at one point, um, but the more recent you have a common ancestor with a different species, the closer related you are to that species. So a really common misconception that people think is that humans evolved from monkeys. That's not true. If we evolved from monkeys, monkeys would, one, no longer be here because they would have all evolved into humans, which is not true, okay? And two, it's just bad science. So we did not evolve from monkeys, but we have a very recent common ancestors with monkeys, and we diverged our separate ways into our separate species from that common ancestor, which is why we share so many traits um, and so many genes, like 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Um, so lots of shared characteristics. And that's, again, what we're talking about when we're talking about macroevolution. All right. Really important thing to get down is if we're talking about speciation, which we are, because that's what macroevolution is, we need to be talking about what the heck a species is. We have a number of different ways that we can um, identify or name what a species is. Okay, so there's four major ways that we identify what species are, meaning like that we have ways that we can differentiate what would be the same species and what would be different species. But the one that's most commonly accepted is the one that's on the slide right in front of you right now, which is the biological species concept, okay? So this defines two different species or two of the same species based on whether or not they can produce viable fertile offspring. And I'll explain that in a second. So if you are the same species as another organism, then you guys can mate and you can produce uh, offspring that are viable, which means living, okay, like capable of life, and fertile, which means capable of reproduction. That's what your offspring would be. They would be alive and they would be able to have babies, okay? If you can get with another organism and make babies that are living and capable of reproduction, then you are the same species as that organism. That is what the biological species concept says, okay? What that means is if Organ two organisms get together or try to get together and they're incapable of producing organisms that are alive and capable of reproduction, then they are not the same species, okay? So this is truly how we define what is and what is not a species based on whether or not they can get together and make babies that are living and fertile, okay? Um, and well, I'm gonna give you like a ton of examples of that in just a second, so stay tuned, okay? Um, something also that's really, really important with this species concept is that gene flow between populations um, is going to hold the phenotype of that population together. So basically what I mean by that is in order for speciation to occur, you really need to stop gene flow between the two populations. Okay? Remember, populations are the same species living in the same area. So if those populations break off and go into two different areas, and that happens, right? We talked a little bit about that with like founder's effect when we talked about microevolution, 
If that happens, in order for speciation to occur, we need to make sure that genes are not flowing between those two populations anymore. Otherwise, they'll go by, right back to ground zero and become a mixed grouping of species of the same species again. Okay, that will make more sense when I give you some examples of speciation. Um, specifically allopatric and sympatric speciation, but just know that we're going to need to stop gene flow between two populations in order for species speciation to occur. All right. In order to stop that gene flow, usually what happens is that these two populations become reproductively isolated. So that just means that they are not capable of reproducing with one another for whatever reason. And we'll talk about lots of examples in just a second about how um, two different populations can become reproductively isolated. Basically, it's just some sort of barrier. Sometimes it's a physical barrier, sometimes not, that prevents two species from mating, okay? which again is going to then prevent gene flow between those populations. Okay? Um, and if they are capable of mating, which usually they are not, then we would say that their offspring is a hybrid. Okay, so the reason I have both of these vocab words for you on this slide is because I'm going to use them um, when we look at this next slide and we look at some pre and post zygotic barriers. Okay, so again, all of these things that I'm about to talk about are ways that we can isolate populations from one another uh, so that they can't reproduce. Okay, so if we can do that, then we can stop gene flow or then gene flow will stop. We're not doing anything here, but gene flow will stop. Um, and speciation is more likely to occur, okay? All right, so here are all of the different ways that species can become reproductively isolated. This is actually a figure from a Campbell textbook. So if you use Campbell, then you have this. I think it's in chapter 25 of your textbook. You can check it out. Um, but on the left-hand side, everything that you see connected with a blue and a yellow arrow, those we call pre-zygotic barriers. And everything on the right hand side we call post zygotic barriers. Okay, so in order to understand what pre and post zygotic barriers are, we need to know what a zygote is. So a zygote is just a fancy, fancy term for a fertilized egg. Okay, so egg and sperm come together, they form a zygote. Zygote is going to eventually develop into offspring. Okay. So on the left-hand side, when I said those blue arrows are pointing towards prezygotic barriers, prezygotic means it comes before the zygote, right? So all of these barriers exist before any type of uh, egg and sperm can come together, any type of mating can occur, okay? On the right-hand side where you see the green arrows, those are post-zygotic barriers, okay? So those are barriers that actually exist between species once mating has occurred. So those species are fully capable of mating with one another, um, but something's happening to their offspring afterwards that's preventing them from either being viable or fertile. Okay. All right. I have a better breakdown here for you. So these are our prezygotic barriers. Okay. On the all the way left hand side, I don't know where my text went. Shoot. Um, on the all the way left hand side, we have something called habitat isolation. Habitat isolation. Okay, so what that means is that those species live in a different habitat and therefore they cannot mate. Okay, so what you're looking at here are two different types of snakes. We have a terrestrial or a sand snake, and we also have a water snake. Now, they're relatively similar. They probably had a recent common ancestor, so they might be capable of reproduction if we forced them to be like in captivity. But because one lives on sand and one lives in the water, they're never going to mate, right? Their habitats have isolated themselves so that they are never capable of mating. And therefore, um, they, are, they are more set um, to become separate species, okay? Or continue to be separate species, I should say. Okay, so habitat isolation all the way on the left. Then we have something called temporal isolation. So this is another prezygotic barrier. It happens um, before the zygote forms, before these two species can make any egg or sperm, okay? So where habitat isolation was that they lived in a different area, you can think of that as like a long distance relationship, no babies being made, they live in different places, okay? Temporal isolation is all about timing, okay? So in this example, you see two skunks that actually mate during different seasons. One skunk's gonna mate during the fall and one skunk's going to mate during the spring, 
uh, which is going to keep their gene pools apart. It's going to prevent gene flow between them um, because they're just not mating at the same time. Okay, um, so this is like if you tell someone, oh, the timing's just not right. That's what these skunks are saying. The timing's just not right um, because we're mating at different seasons, okay? Next one is a personal favorite. This is called behavioral isolation, okay? And this all has to do with like courtship rituals. Usually we see courtship rituals in birds and humans, but birds like they have a special song or they have a special dance that they do for mating, okay? And each species is going to have a separate song or dance that is going to attract their specific mates. So there's a ton of videos on this. If you're not sure, if you don't believe me, um, you can check them out of different mating calls and mating dances and how that actually helps um, just birds of the same species mating with one another as opposed to with birds of a different species, okay? So those three all happen before these organisms can even attempt to mate. So they either live in a different habitat, they mate at a different time, or they have a different mating ritual, different behaviors. Okay, these next two are still going to happen before egg and sperm actually come together. But um, the, these two organisms would attempt to mate. Okay, so the two snails that you see, it's labeled F, says mechanical isolation. Those <laughs> mechanical isolation basically in, in layman's terms just means the parts don't fit. Right, so these two animals cannot mate because their their sexual reproduction organs do not fit together. So in this specific instance, these two snails actually have shells that go in opposite directions. So you'll see one goes clockwise and one goes counterclockwise, and because of that, they can't match up in order to mate, so they won't form a zygote. Okay, and then that last one, gametic isolation, just means that the egg and sperm aren't capable of fusion together. Okay, that's actually a really challenging thing for egg and sperm to come together and fuse. So if egg and sperm do get in proximity of one another, they won't fuse together. Okay, so all of those are pre-zygotic barriers. They happen before egg and sperm fuse. They can happen before a zygote is formed. Okay, so on this next slide, we're going to talk about post zygotic barriers. And post-zygotic barriers obviously happen after the zygote, after the egg and sperm come together, okay? So um, as you can see on this slide, they're, they're a little bit less common and we can kind you can kind of think about why they might be less common. Um, and I always like to try to tell my students um, to tie things back to the why. So post-zygotic barriers, these are going to be things that exist um, to prevent offspring from being either viable, living, or fertile, right? But these two organisms went through the whole process of mating and creating an offspring, which is incredibly energy consuming, right? It uses a lot of energy to create and grow a child or an offspring. Um, so because of that, uh, more often than not, there's going to be a barrier in place before all of that energy is spent, right? That's just good evolutionary practice um, that, that that's going to be the case, okay? So these are going to be less common, um, but still, if two organisms are capable of mating and producing a zygote, if they're not the same species, right, that means that they can't produce viable and fertile offspring, so something's going to happen to that offspring. There's three possible op options. One is reduced hybrid viability. So the hybrids, right, the combination of uh, the two different species parents just don't live very long, okay? So they're they're weak, they're sickly, they don't make it very long. Sometimes they'll make it a few days, a few weeks, but they're not going to be um, sustainable and they're not going to be able to live um, as nearly, nearly, nearly as long as uh, offspring where two of the same species are meeting, okay? In the middle there, we have reduced hybrid fertility. This is one of my other favorites, okay? So if you guys have heard of mules, Mules are a mixture of a horse and a donkey. Horses and donkeys are different species, okay? But mules, so you're like, well, well how, how can they be different species if they can come together and mate? Well, mules are sterile. Mules are not capable of reproducing, okay? So when you mix the donkey and the horse, different species, to produce this offspring, the offspring that you produce is incapable of reproduction. They are infertile, okay? Um, so still following that biological species concept. Last one is hybrid breakdown. Um, so this sometimes happens. So in the picture, it's a group of grasses uh, where at first the offspring actually look to be okay. 
they look to be normal and relatively healthy. Uh, but over time, they'll start to, if they keep reproducing, their offspring will get weaker and weaker, start to die off, and, and eventually we won't see them.